story begins in 1892, 29 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Our story has passion, courage, and perseverance. It is a story of the founding of our beloved university. 1892 was an eventful year for black Americans in both good ways and bad. While African Americans in the South were no longer branded like livestock and forced to work from sun up to sundown, they were not truly free. Instead, these former slaves and their descendants were bound by Jim Crow laws, which kept them from reaching their fullest potential. In 1892, a record 161 African Americans were lynched, including friends of Ida B. Wells. Wells went on to lead anti-lynching campaigns. Meanwhile, Homer Plessy was arrested for sitting in a whites-only rail car in Louisiana, an event that led to the landmark separate but equal Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court case. Though they were oppressed and faced racism and terrorism, there were many positive advances for the black community. Ciceretta Jones became the first African American to perform at Carnegie Hall, and black doctors in Atlanta founded the National Medical Association. The first issue of the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper was published, and last but certainly not least, Slater Industrial Academy was founded 125 years ago today by Dr. Simon Green Atkins. Simon Green Atkins, born June 11, 1863, to Allen and Eliza Atkins in Chatham County, North Carolina. His parents were farmers, and Simon contributed dutifully to his work on the farm. His early exposure to hard labor, Christian values, and a traditional education helped set the future and shape the mind for young Simon. His intelligence was evident. He, had, he was mentored by some influential educators, and Miss Annie Cooper took personal interest in him. He demonstrated extensive vocabulary and impressive memory, and that made him stand out amongst his pupils. Young Simon had a passion for learning and teaching, and with that passion, he soon emerged as a leader. From 1880 to 1884, a young Simon studied at St. Augustine's Normal and Collegiate Institute in Raleigh, North Carolina. After graduating with distinction, Professor Atkins was invited to join the faculty at Livingstone College in Salisbury, North Carolina. Simon was so passionate about education that during his summers, he facilitated institutes for African-American teachers throughout North Carolina. While at Livingstone, Professor Atkins founded the North Carolina Teachers Association. The association coordinated the efforts of black teachers and educators to request improved schoolhouses, textbooks, and materials. They became advocates for their students, attacking poverty, hunger, ignorance, and racism. Professor Atkins was co-editor of the North Carolina Teachers Association's publication, The Progressive Educator. In 1889, after several years of frustration with the unfair treatment by the North Carolina legislature towards black educators, Professor Atkins wrote an editorial airing his views. Is 
opposition to Negro education in the present legislature in North Carolina. We regret this, not more on account of its special relation to the race to which we belong, than for a position in which it places a great state in its powerful adverse reflection upon humanity and Christianity of our white fellow citizens. That no earthly power can stay the education of the Negro is the one great fact with reference to the race that is full of hope. If it be the great purpose of our enemies to obstruct our progress, repress our ambition, and thwart our splendid possibilities by keeping us in darkness, in weakness of ignorance, they will be disappointed. We will be educated. For young Professor Atkins, there seemed to be no rest and no peace. were quite challenging for young Professor Atkins as an educator and social justice advocate, good fortune brought Miss Oleona Pegram into his life. Oleona was born in New Bern, North Carolina, and she was educated at Scotia Women's College in Concord, North Carolina, and Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. An accomplished educator in her own right, Oleona was the perfect match for Professor Atkins. The happy pair married on September 3rd, 1889. They enjoyed their work in Livingstone College. In 1890, Dr. Atkins was invited to become principal of Depot Street in Winston-Salem the largest African-American school in the state. Committed to his community, Mr. Atkins initiated a project to develop Columbian Heights. He also 
this particular community was uh, designed in order for them blacks to be able to have better housing as well as ownership opportunities. Simon and Oleona continued their work in the community and in education. But Simon was not pleased with the quality of teaching and education that existed at the Depot School and other African American schools in the state. Simon is noted for stating, It is impossible to have an effective public school without providing for the training of teachers the blind cannot lead the blind. Simon and Oleona knew that something had to be done. Professor Atkins knew exactly what was needed. He and Oleana had the wisdom, experience, and foresight to build a school for higher learning, but they needed additional resources. Being a man of action, Professor Atkins began reaching out for assistance and telling potential benefactors his dream for an industrial academy. I dream a world where a man 
no other man will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul, nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and every man is free. Where wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a pearl attends the needs of all mankind. Of such I dream my world. This vision was bold. They dreamed of an institution in which every student would be equipped with an education designed to intellectually prepare the head, the hands, and the heart. The fulfillment of their dream became a reality with just 25 students and one instructor in a one-room frame structure. Oh yes, the Atkinses dreamed a world. They aspired to have an institution that rivaled Harvard and that would offer an unparalleled educational experience to the descendants of former slaves. To make their dreams a reality, the Atkins spent countless hours raising funds so that they can build their dream. They had ben banking benefactors such as John Fox Slater, 
Henry Ellis Fries, William Allen Blair, Judge H.R. Starbuck, and A.H. Eller, and the county and the state. Slater Industrial Academy became a reality September 28, 1892. One hundred and twenty-five years later, we thank Dr. Simon Green and Mrs. Oleona Pegram Atkins for their selfless contributions. Thanks to their contributions, thousands of scholars have entered this university to learn and have departed to serve. We now honor all of those who have made our beloved Winston-Salem State University what it is today.
Today, our story and institution is facing a brilliant future. to tell us about the proud accomplishments of the present day and share with us the pathway to the future, I welcome to the stage Winston-Salem State University's 13th Chancellor, Dr. Elwood L. Robinson. Standing this morning on the shoulders of giants, I pause this morning to reflect on 125 years and understand what a special place this is. As I got up this morning and thinking about this great university, I'm reminded of the students that I meet every day that begin to challenge me and begin to lay out a blueprint and help us drive this university to greatest heights. As I was walking across campus yesterday, I ran into a student and she asked me two questions. She was filming and had a camera and was doing an interview for one of the organizations on campus. And she asked me if you could ask Dr. Atkins one question, what would that be? And the second thing she asked me, she said, Chancellor, why is it so difficult to be a Ram? <laughs> I don't know if I had an answer to the second one, but maybe at the end of this presentation today, we all will have an answer to the second one in terms of why it's so difficult to be a ram. But that's the question then got me to thinking about what I would ask Dr. Atkins, what question I would ask him. And I started thinking about people in my life and important people in my life, and believe it or not, during that moment, I thought about my father who passed over a decade ago. And as I was thinking about him and what question I would ask Dr. Atkins is the exact same question that I would ask my father if he was alive today. Did we make you proud? <laughs> Did we make you proud? 
Simon Green Action started a revolution like none other. Creating this school in 1892, he was a brilliant individual with a brilliant mind that had a pedigree like none other. He was able to study with some of the world's great thought masters of the day. At St. Augustine's, he was able to study. At Livingstone, was able to study with some of the great minds of the day, and they began to develop in him what kind of university was important for educating Negroes of the day. Now, he had a very special place. His place is unique in the historical annals. Where do we find Dr. Atkins within the intellectual thought about what kind of education was needed for African Americans of that day? We find him among some of the brilliant scholars of the day. If we look at, during that time, a raging debate about what kind of education was necessary for recently freed slaves, what kind of education would we give them? Raging debate on one side with Frederick Douglass and W.E. Du Bois on one side of that debate and Booker T. Washington on another side of the debate and Dr. Atkins looked at both of this, and he looked at that debate, and he said, neither one is where we ought to be. He said, we, it is about educating not individuals for mechanics, mechanics, as he would say, but educating the entire human being, the heart, the soul, and the mind. And he would orchestrate a different kind of educational experience for recently freed slaves. And so the work that we do here is built upon that vision about what an institution should be. And so every day that we wake up here at Winston-Salem State University, the work that we do is built and centered around that historic vision. And so as he, as you have seen in this performance today, as he went around and he asked folks, and, I want to start a school, and someone said, what will you teach at that school? Dr. Atkins was brilliant in his response, and he answered that with a question. He said, what do they teach at the world's great universities like Harvard? What do they teach at the world's great universities? That's what I will teach at my university. So in 2017, when people ask me, what kind of educational experience are you designing at Winston-Salem State University? What kind of experience do you want your students to have? What do they get when they come to Winston-Salem State University? I ask them and answer them with the same way that Dr. Atkins answered it in 1892. I simply say, what kind of education do they get at Harvard or the world's great universities? He was instrumental in starting a movement of the day. One of the greatest, one of this country's greatest movements was the development and the creation of historically black colleges or black colleges of the day because black colleges were so very important about telling the story about, about black life. There have been so many myths that have been distorted what we were about. Those colleges gave us an opportunity to make crystal clear who we are, that we are no different from anyone else, that our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations are just like everybody else. And we deserve the same things that they have. So every day here at Winston-Salem State University, that is the platform in which we operate. That is critical to our new strategic plan and our new strategic initiatives. So we are here in 2017 at one of this world's great universities. We have seen tremendous strides over the past years in how we have changed the academic metrics at our institution. We've looked at what we teach and the courses that we teach, and we've looked at our curriculum, and we have updated it, and we have made sure it was state of the arts, and we have changed it to make sure when students leave here, they have an education that's second to none. We have, as a result, you have seen, we've changed our graduation and retention rates. We've invested in our faculty. Over the last three years since I've been here at Winston-Salem State, we've brought in over 100 new faculty 
at this institution. A hundred new faculty. Yeah. who come to this institution wanting to be a part of it, wanting to impart and give the students the kind of education that they need in order to be successful. And what we have seen is as a result of that, we've seen an increase over the past few years in faculty scholarship because of that. We have vigorously implemented our master plan on campus that you have seen. If you walked around campus, you've seen the construction and the building that's going on we have new residence halls, a new one on the way, a brand new science building that will be online in a few years. We have looked at our campus and make sure that it was beautiful and spacious, and we utilized all the resources that were necessary to make it inviting. And that's what we have done here. What we have seen over the past years is, is an increase in giving to this university. Alumni now are giving at an all-time high. Thank you. In terms of looking at alumni giving, now 11.4%. 11.4% of alumni giving. Now, that actually really deserves an applause because that is, <laughs> that is, believe it or not, more than the national average of all universities in this country and almost double HBCUs. So give yourself a hand in terms of giving to the university. We've had a tremendous increase in folks giving to this university for scholarships for our students. This last year alone, we awarded $1.25 million in scholarships for our students. And we did that because of you, not state dollars, not federal dollars, dollars that folks gave us for scholarships. And we have changed this campus so much. And we've done all of these things while leading the University of North Carolina system in degree production, degree efficient, and job placement upon graduation. I'll, I'll take another applause for that. I mean, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> and so as we, as we look at that, someone said, and someone, a reporter asked me, said, well, what does the future bring? Where are you going with all of this? Well, there are three, there are three things. There are three ways that we're going with this. And, and looking at that, we must. We have designed and this team of individuals on this campus, and everybody is part of our team, everybody on campus, faculty, staff, student, alumni, our boards, work in sync to make this university great. And as we have designed an experience for students to make sure that we prepare them for a world that we don't even know what's happening with it. We don't know what the next job markets are, but we're preparing them to be flexible. But what we want to make sure is that the work that we do here, particularly from an academic perspective, is signature, that it becomes unique, and this is what Winston-Salem State is known for. We must make sure that the experiences that we give each and every student is equitable. So we want to take what we're doing and not give it to just 10% of our students, but to make sure that each and every student gets a high-quality education. So we want to make sure that the work that we do is scalable. And lastly, we want to make sure that we can guarantee, and we will guarantee that because of your help, that every student that comes to Winston-Salem State University has an opportunity to get involved in this work that we're doing. And so we want to make sure that it is sustainable. So that's the direction that, we go, that we're going. And that is the future of this university and where we are about. As you have seen today, starting one room, one teacher, 25 students, 2017, 50 buildings, 300 faculty, and over 5,000 students. <laughs> Winston-Salem State University has withstood the test of time. She has withstood the storms of life, made a full recovery after each one and grew stronger. And she grew stronger because of the courage, determination, and the faith of our founder, 
who believed in this institution. If we look at the arc of history, far outreaches vision. We've seen it so often. The arc bends. And why does it bend? It bends because we can't see around the corner. We can't see the storms. We can't see the trouble spots. But understand very clearly, we don't get worried about what the future brings. When it bends, we respond to it. We abolish slavery. We grant it universal suffrage. We end it Jim Crow. We fought, bled, and died for civil rights. And we continue every day to fight for a world where we're not judged by the color of our skin, by race, sex, sexual orientation, or our belief, but by the content of our character. We're reminded every single day that we have done the hard work before in every single time. It took trying to convince those people. It was a fierce battle between those who believed that we couldn't even change the rules and those who said that we already did. We changed the world before. We will change it again. We must move forward with an optimism, and that is the challenge for us believing, and that's what we do here at Winston-Salem State every day, getting students to believe that it is possible the multiple possibilities that are in our future. And as we, as we move forward, and as we go into the future, we go with an unyielding and undenying faith. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and my pleasure to present to you, under the direction of Dewala Simmons Burke, Dr. Myron Brown on piano, the Winston-Salem State University Singing Rams Choir, performing Lift Every Voice and Sing.
Now, please, let's give a warm round of applause as we welcome back to the stage the Burke Singers. <laughs> the WSSU Singing Rams. The MB Dance Company. WSSU's very own Scarlet Lace. Our griots for the evening, Miss Sharon Hill, Mr. Austin Greer, Dr. Sansare Spies, 
Mr. Daryl Jeter. Mr. Theotis Chung. And Mr. Frederick L. Roundtree. Mr. and Mrs. Simon Green Atkins, played by the distinguished Mr. James Pope and the beautiful Miss Alexis Duncan. Now we will welcome back our Chancellor and Mrs. Edward L. Robinson. This time, we would uh, invite members of the uh, Atkins family to join us on stage, please, for the singing of the alma mater, if you can, if you will.
Is it up? Do I close it? We want to thank you all for coming out to this. We hope you enjoyed the performance. I do want to recognize, uh, before we leave, we have a number of dignitaries in the house. We got a, a, a elected officials here. Uh, we got folks who work every day for Winston-Salem State. We're all, well, everybody's standing. But we certainly want to recognize and let you know that we have a number of folks here. Thank you for coming out to today's program. We look forward to having you outside in the party, and we'll see you later. Thank you.